Uh, my name is Ben Nully. I'm the new public policy director at Iowa Pork, replacing Drew Mogler. Uh, started in uh, late November and most recently had worked as an associate editor for AgriPulse Communications in Washington, D.C. Uh, covered pork, dairy, and biofuel policy for them at the U.S. Capitol. Uh, before my time at D.C., I moved to Iowa from Missouri, uh, where I was a farm radio broadcaster for the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network and then worked as an agricultural assistant for Senator Ernst before heading to D.C. Uh, but this uh, next guy next to me doesn't need an introduction. Uh, Eldon McAfee, he's graduated from Iowa State University, uh, major in farm operations, and then farm before attending Drake University Law School. He was with the Des Moines law firm Beving, Swanson & Forrest for more than 23 years until several years ago where he and Julie Viscoschel joined the Brick Gentry Law Firm and formed their agricultural law group. Eldon provides legal counsel to the Iowa Pork Producers Association, the Iowa Cattlemen's Association, Iowa Poultry Association, and other Iowa farm organizations, as well as individual livestock, crop producers, and ag businesses. So uh, welcome to today's seminar. And Eldon, uh, we'll kind of get started here. Uh, talking about uh, kind of the water quality front and looking at some of those uh, cases. Can you tell me just a little bit about um, where we are there and uh, what, uh, what we've seen so far? Sure. Um, before we do that, Ben, if I could, uh, anyone who does not have a handout outline, uh, all the slides, we, we won't cover them all, folks. There's 50 some there. Don't worry. Uh, but we have a handout, and if you didn't get one walking in, raise your hand, please, and uh, one will be brought around to you. So while we're doing that, um, I will say uh, good to be here after being gone for uh, a, a year and not being able to get together. Good to see you. Um, and uh, we'll get to Ben's question. I'm not dodging it. I may dodge some of his questions today, but not that one. Uh, as you can tell, and if those of you have been to these before, it's a uh, uh, coffee chat with Eldon. One thing I will say, uh, there has been a discussion here this morning, and we'd like this on your comment sheets if you would. Uh, Jamie's looking at me. Uh, if you would be in favor of moving this to the afternoon in future years, maybe 5.30, 6 o'clock, and beers with Eldon, I just... Uh, <laughs> and, and you're buying. But anyway, <laughs> I am a lawyer, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, glad to have you here. Coffee chat. What we mean is let's, uh, let's uh, relax the atmosphere a little bit. Uh, if you have a question, we'll, uh, we've got a, a, a mic to bring around and so we can get it on the, uh, uh, on the tape, on the virtual presentation. Question you have as we go uh, is when you should ask it. Uh, if you look at your handout on slide two, <laughs> you, you know you're in a lawyer's presentation when he has a table of contents to his, uh, to his PowerPoint slides, right? Uh, uh, anyway, I probably violate every rule there is about PowerPoint slides. You know, you're supposed to be concise, just have a bullet point. No, you get everything in these slides, and I know they're a little hard to read in places, but I think you'll have access to this when it goes online if you can't. Some of that print gets a little small. I have a little hard time reading it, but I, my goal with these slides, folks, is to give you a reference tool if you need it, if you don't, fine, but rather than just present a topic to you and then, pre and then talk about it, I try and give you some of the background, some of the, uh, uh, the rules, citations, etc. Real quickly, uh, uh, look at the contents, if you would, and uh, Drew, excuse me, there I go. There uh, don't keep track of how many times I say that, all right? Ben, uh, start out with water quality, and we'll, uh, again, I'll get to his question in a minute, but uh, then we're going to try and talk about ag fraud and trespass laws, and uh, this has uh, obviously been in the news here uh, in the last few days. Uh, we'll talk about the laws we have and how they're working, how maybe they're not working, what the courts think of them. I mean, this is a, a, a seminar about lawsuits, and uh, uh, unfortunately, we have a few to talk about. What's interesting is the main topic, nuisance, probably should have been the other way around in the title, and that is um, you know, legal issues update and nuisance, because in the nuisance arena, uh, knock on wood, pat yourselves on the back, 
don't get too complacent, but we, we don't have any nuisance lawsuits against agricultural operations that I'm aware of where trial is pending in the state of Iowa. And it's been a long time since I've been able to say that. But uh, last time, I think a few years ago, I said that one time, and then <laughs> all of a sudden there were three or four filed. Uh, I, hopefully they weren't following me. But anyway, we'll talk about it. Still an important topic, have some important rulings, and then we'll, I know there are some of you that don't deal with the lawsuit part of it directly. Oh, I forgot, we are gonna talk about Prop 12 a little bit, Ben, right? Yes. Nobody's heard of that, right? And uh, there, there's some other uh, uh, programs on the uh, uh, poor Congress that will cover it in more detail, but we will talk about that. But I know a lot of you, consultants, producers, et cetera, deal with DNR regulation. We don't have any new regulations right now, uh, but what I try and do here is give you some of the practical issues, I'll call them, that I've dealt with as attorney for the Iowa pork producers and attorney for individual producers, and some of those things where uh, DNR may take an interpretation that you uh, scratch your head a little bit over, and, and we'll talk about that. I, I should quit talking about what I'm going to talk about, and we'll get into it here quickly. And then, uh, depending on how much time we have, uh, we have a few topics at the end. But if you have another topic you want to ask about, feel free. This is uh, your presentation as well. Ben, I almost forgot your question. Uh, so, water quality. Yes, so basically, um, on this water quality issue, one of the cases was with Iowa CCI Food and Water Watch, uh, filed in 2019. So can you kind of give us a little bit of background on that and uh, why this case was dismissed in the Iowa Supreme Court? Okay. We've got a couple of slides here. There's slides uh, uh, three and four, and you've got the hard copy there. Um, this is what I, I sometimes refer to as uh, this case was Des Moines Water Works too, and that's not accurate from a legal perspective because Des Moines Water Works was not a party to the lawsuit, but this is the case where uh, uh, these groups alleged what we call the public trust doctrine and said, in their lawsuit filed here in Polk County against the state of Iowa, argued public officials, governor, EPC, Environmental Protection Commission, DNR, you're not doing your job. You're not enacting the rules, not enacting the legislation that protects water quality. Judge, tell them to do it. Make them do it uh, under the public trust doctrine. And I won't get into that legal issue, but it's on uh, uh, slide four. Um, is it advancing or? Okay, all right, slide four. Um, the, the Iowa Supreme Court ruled in uh, June 18th, four to three, so it was close. Thank you. It was close, but the court dismissed it. And the court basically said, you're, you're violating the separation of powers. Uh, you know, remember uh, high school uh, government? Uh, and I'm being sarcastic, you all know this beyond that. We have our three branches of government and the legislature has their job, courts have theirs. Court's job is not to do theirs, not to step in and to order somebody to do something. That's up to the uh, people uh, and their elected representatives. Um, there's not much more to say about that. Uh, it was close. I believe one reason it was close because it was a motion to dismiss. There had been no trial, there had been nothing beyond a, a, a lawsuit filed, which means that uh, it's a very high standard to meet to get a motion to dismiss, and that's really what the three judges who dissented uh, said, hey, this is too soon, we need to go a little further, and the majority pretty much said, why should we go further? The Oregon tried it, and they took them years of litigation, and they ended up the same place we are. It's been criticized roundly, uh, soundly, roundly, by a, a lot of people as uh, being uh, not correct, but the Supreme Court has ruled. I don't know of any other water quality litigation, as, uh, uh, as I would call it, in, on the books right now, uh, but that's where we stand right now, okay? Kind of a follow-up there. What weight does this add to future cases that could come up? Uh, this, was, this is Iowa Supreme Court decision uh, in the state of Iowa. This is very, very important. It's binding precedent on at least this issue of arguing that the state officials uh, can be forced by a court to do something they have chosen not to. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a very important decision. 
Okay. Moving on to um, ag fraud and trespass law, it was introduced in 2012. Um, this went through uh, some changes between now and then. So can you kind of bring us up to speed on, on what's happening today and where we're at there? All right, ag fraud and trespass. Many people call these laws the word ag and then dash G-A-G. I refuse to use that term. That was a term coined by the press and for those who oppose the type of uh, agriculture we practice and I don't use it. It's ag fraud or ag trespass. That better describes what these laws are about. Little history, I'm on slide five. Uh, ag fraud law was passed in 2012 and uh, two parts to it. It's a crime, criminal misdemeanor to use false pretenses to obtain access to an ag facility. Ag facility is primarily a, a production facility, livestock farm, or, and it's a crime to make a false statement on a job application uh, to be employed at one. Well, right away, and uh, slide uh, six, not right away, I'm wrong. Seven years later, the uh, federal court ruled it was unconstitutional. It was an infringement on free speech rights. Okay, so threw the law out at the district court level, and then over on slide seven, here's another very important case that came out. Circle this one if you're uh, keeping track. Um, this was decided August 10th of this year. It took it a while to get up to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. We're talking federal court here, not state court. And the federal court, uh, if I back up a little bit, bit Decisions in other states on similar laws, maybe worded, worded differently, but the same concept, had pretty much routinely found they were unconstitutional. There was one in Idaho uh, that found the uh, access provision unconstitutional, but found the employment provision constitutional, worded a little differently than ours here. This court went the opposite way. This court, and I think this is a major decision, we're gonna talk a little bit more about it down on slide 11, but this uh, court found that, what essentially, cut into the chase, the court said, these people are trespassing. They're trespassing on other people's property, don't have permission to be there. That's, the property rights are, are number one. And this court said, uh, you have a right to protect your property and it's a crime to trespass on that property. And that, it, that uh, uh, based on that, they found it constitutional. Now the argument against it, and some of you have heard uh, uh, over the years uh, from these cases that some lies are okay if nobody's harmed. You know, nominal damage, et cetera. And the district court judge had said, okay, yeah, they're trespassing, but what's the damage? They didn't destroy anything. They don't steal anything. Yeah, anyway, um, so there's no, no, no harm, no foul in, it, in essence. This court said, in my uh, opinion, uh, my paraphrasing, doesn't matter. Nominal damages or not. It's trespassing, it's their private property, and it's a crime to do that even though you can't show significant damages to property, et cetera. I think this decision here is a major decision on that part of it. The employment part, the court said it was written too broadly and uh, could have applied to uh, you know, uh, false statements that had nothing to do with the issue at hand for employment. Um, and, but even then, there was out of the three judges, one of them dissented and would have found it, uncon or f found it constitutional as well. I wanna tell you what, I should have put the slides in a different order, but I didn't. Um, Let's go to slide 11 and then we'll come back. Talk about current events. Okay, just this week, or last week, excuse me, many of you have read about this, slide 11. There was a case in Wright County District Court against an individual for violating. Now, the reason I don't have it in the same order is this, here I go jumping around, this the law at issue in this case was the food operation trespass law, which was adopted as the third law we adopted. It isn't the one we're talking about here. So what I'm gonna say is, the reason I jumped ahead is, the district court in this case cited to that Eighth Circuit case as support for finding the food operation trespass law was constitutional. 
That's the reason I wanted to jump ahead. But as I think about it, let's go back um, and talk about the second law. Uh, it was adopted in 2019. After Idaho's law was found constitutional on the employment part, the Iowa legislature modeled another law, the egg trespass law, after the Idaho law. Well, then um, it goes to court later that year in the federal district court. Same judge ruled it was unconstitutional, again, as an infringement on free speech rights. That is still in court and pretty much was on hold until the Eighth Circuit ruled on the first law. Are you, are you keeping track here? Because anyway, it gets a little confusing. Uh, any of you who heard uh, the big show here on Monday with uh, uh, Bob Quinn, he laid it out in, uh, in, in a question to me, and I see uh, 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 an attendee here smiling. I, I pretty much said, Bob, you had the right analysis. You just mixed about two courts and two different laws together to get there. It does get confusing. But that law is still pending in the courts, and the court was waiting on the decision in the Eighth Circuit case and I think it should, we don't know for sure that it's being briefed right now, but that decision is, is precedent on a different law, and we'll see how the court interprets this 2019 law, which the, it was all about, uh, uh, the main part of it was the employment part. Okay, now let's go to, um, uh, let me catch up here. All right. 2020, the food operation trespass law. This was passed not just, it doesn't apply just to livestock, it applies to food operations, which include uh, farms, but also includes processing facilities, et cetera. It's a, another law that says it's a crime. Now, the, the penalties uh, are uh, uh, a little higher here. It's an aggravated misdemeanor and then becomes a class D felony upon subsequent offenses. But this is the law that, again, uh, across the board, not specific just to livestock farms, but food operations, and makes it a crime to trespass, period. Okay, now we get to slide 11 that I was talking about. This law was challenged in this case. This individual was arrested for uh, violating the food operation trespass law in, in Wright County. Trial was scheduled for last Thursday, however, Prior to that, and this is where dates are important uh, on that slide 11, end of December, the defense, the defendant's attorneys filed a motion to dismiss arguing the law that he was being charged with was unconstitutional. Okay, that was filed on uh, December 28th. Then we come along, uh, I think they had held a hearing, but the court hadn't ruled on it yet. Then on last Tuesday, January 18th, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the state filed a motion to dismiss. That is, the Wright County Attorney's Office filed a motion to dismiss, and all the motion said was, in the interest of justice, this case should be dismissed, okay? At 4 o'clock that afternoon, 5 o'clock, excuse me, I believe, that same afternoon, the defense, the ones who filed the motion to dismiss to start with, objected to this motion to dismiss and as I have in my slides, and all of this is taken right out of the court file, okay? Right out of the documents. Uh, the defendant has a right to be vindicated in a court of law, and the food operation trespass law continues to violate his constitutional rights to freedom of speech. All right, that's 5 o'clock. 6.45 on January 18th, the judge issues the ruling, not on that motion, but on the motion filed on December 28th that moved to dismiss it for being unconstitutional, and the judge issued a, a ruling finding it was constitutional and basically cited to that Eighth Circuit case with some other analysis and found it was not an infringement on free speech rights here. And based on that, it would have went to trial, but we had the motion to dismiss by the state. The next day, the, the case was dismissed, okay? so. Some confusion there, uh, you know, about which, which motion, which law, et cetera. I think, what do we take away from this as producers? You know, there, there's no substitute for being very vigilant in our security, our employment practices, et cetera. But we do have 
two laws now on the books in the state of Iowa that have been ruled by a judge, uh, one in federal court in uh, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals and here in a district court uh, criminal action to be constitutional. I'm not saying the fight's over, not by a long ways, but we've got some decisions, have some decisions here in Iowa that some other states don't have. All I can say is stay tuned and if you have, a, 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 hopefully you don't have an issue, but if you do, uh, contact law enforcement immediately and uh, hopefully you've got some, have some help here that your county attorney can use if necessary. Okay? All right, Ben. Sorry for the long-winded discussion. No, that's, that's, that's totally fine. We wanted to get up to speed on, on kind of what was going on there. So can you talk now about kind of Prop 12? Uh, obviously, this is a big concern for pork producers, uh, not only in Iowa, but across the country as uh, California voters adopted this in 2018, but yet we are still yet to see rules from uh, the California Department of Agriculture, and now this case is also pending in front of the Supreme Court. So what's next here? I think what we'll do, Ben, is just give it an overview and hopefully some of you or you can attend the other sessions here. Um, but uh, and Ben, in your job, uh, you're, you've been in it, what, a couple months now? Two months, you, yes. Uh, you've spent some time on, <clears throat> pardon me, on this, I assume. Yeah, uh, when I was in D.C., I covered uh, this uh, when I was working for AgriPulse Communications and, and basically just a brief overview. It, it will restrict um, housing requirements and uh, for sows going into or products being sold into California. And so um, obviously this case is pending through in front of the Supreme Court. So we're watching kind of what, what the court's going to do there. They have not yet um, decided if they're going to hear the case. And so what should producers be, be ready for now? <laughs> I get the easy questions. Uh, what should we be ready for? We should be ready for more uncertainty, okay? How's that? Uh, but we do have a very good decision uh, in California. Came out uh, on, uh, uh, on Monday. I'm, many of you have heard about it. I'm on slide 16, and I know that's one of those that's a little hard to read. I tried to cram too much into it. but. First of all, Prop 12, you know, the 24 square feet for uh, breeding animals and the turnaround requirements. Adopted, I'm back on slide 15, uh, adopted uh, to go into effect, voter initiative adopted to go into effect January 1, 2022. This is January 26, 2022. So by law, by the very law as it was written, it was effective as of January 1, 2022. A lot of things went on prior to that uh, uh, by, uh, well, we had four lawsuits. We're on uh, page, or slide 16. The North American Meat Institute filed a lawsuit in California federal courts. It was uh, not successful, and the U.S. Supreme Court refused to take it up. Then we have the National Pork Producers Council and American Farm Bureau Federation filed lawsuit in uh, California federal courts. What's the argument that, the, that Prop 12 is unconstitutional? And I will, uh, uh, this won't be something you'll want to put in a legal journal. Uh, my description is you cannot adopt a law in one state that regulates what happens in another state. Now, that is a gross uh, oversimplification, but it's called the Dormant Commerce Clause. Dormant <laughs> because Federal law says, uh, the federal constitution says the federal government will regulate interstate commerce. This is the, the Dormant Commerce Clause is a body of law that uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ha and other courts have ruled on that says if the federal government's can, uh, government has sole authority over interstate commerce, states you can't. And when you adopt a law in your state that affects other states and tells them what they can or can't do, then that is effect, uh, regulating interstate commerce. <clears throat> now you say, why did two courts say it, it isn't? And I won't get into a lot of detail. The, I'll, uh, Michael Formica, attorney with the National Pork Producer, raise your hand, Michael. Uh, he's in the back there. He's on a panel. Yeah, yeah, you don't get to sit there for nothing. Uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> Michael's on a panel. Correct, and you'll be delving into some of the uh, details here, but 
my goal here today, and they'll talk about the uh, recent cases, and they'll talk, uh, is mainly to let you know uh, that's the bottom line, dormant commerce clause, and that's, uh, but how could the courts rule against it? Because there's a lot, are a lot of nooks and crannies to it. Is it a price? Uh, is dormant commerce clause only regulate uh, you know prices and how one state tries to affect uh, the the interstate commerce through prices? Uh, again, I'm butchering a lot of that, but that gives you the crux of it. So, <clears throat> because I've had producers say, well, it should be cut and dried. They adopted a law, and now you're telling me I have to change my gestation housing to meet that law. How can California tell me what to do here in Iowa? Uh, uh, Michael will answer that question today later, okay? Anyway, Iowa Pork Producers Association, we're on slide 16, filed a lawsuit uh, in, uh, uh, I believe it was May, alleging much those same things, and the thought was, well, let's sue California here in Iowa. And because it's affecting us here in Iowa, we're the leading pork producing state, et cetera. I'll uh, cut to the chase, the federal judge, uh, uh, said, you can't sue Iowa, or you can't sue California and Iowa. That, that the proper place, the personal jurisdiction is in California. So dismiss the case. Uh, <clears throat> Iowa Pork Producers Association then filed a case in California, which the judge here in Iowa had pretty much said, that's where you should have filed and you're free to do it. And that's what Iowa Pork Producers Association did. Only what is being challenged in that lawsuit in California, because there had already been two filed on the Dormant Commerce Clause part of it, is criminal due process. Prop 12 has criminal penalties in it for those who violate it. And the basically the argument is, in a criminal law, you have to be very specific about what the violations are, what, uh, you know, what you have to do to avoid committing a crime, and we don't have regulations yet, and you're gonna hear that again, and that is the point in that law that it is vague, the regulations aren't in place, and it should not, uh, under criminal due process, it's unconstitutional. That case, that case is pending, there's a hearing before the judge in federal court in California on February 28th. Now, look at that last bullet point, and you know, some people, uh, 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 People, uh, my partners and even my spouse get on me for waiting to do these slides till the last minute. Yeah? You know. Hey, look at that last bullet point. January, we've had two cases today where I've discussed recent, uh, two instances where I've discussed cases. Here's a case from January 24th. <clears throat> if I'd have done my slides early, I wouldn't have it in there, right? That's my justification. <clears throat> California District Court. Grocers, Restaurant Association, et cetera, filed a case in California District Court asking, arguing that uh, the, no regulations have been finalized and issued, so they wanted a 28-month time period delay after the final regulations are issued before they have to comply as, as grocers, as restaurants, et cetera, to, to meet, to serve only meat pork that meets the requirements of Prop 12. Uh, on Monday, January 24th, the uh, state court judge in California granted their request, but for six months, not 28 months. And that, uh, again, very important decision, California state court. The question is, how, does, how, how broad is it? Uh, you know, typical, I'm still digesting it and it's still being looked at. Um, I think it's broad enough to, to prohibit the state of California from enforcing Prop 12 until, again, in any way, shape, or form as Prop 12 is uh, supposedly going to be enforced uh, until, um, again, uh, 180 days, six months after the regulations are final. When will the regulations be final? I don't know. Uh, Michael, I, again, it, it appears it'll be some time. Michael just did this. Michael just said uh, they, they have said at the end of last year there will be another round, right? Yeah, we don't know for sure. The process finalizing regulations takes a while. I've heard uh, speculation it'll be 
could be towards the end of 2022. I don't know, nobody knows, could be sooner. This judge has said the law cannot go into effect until six months after that, okay? So uh, again, a major decision. I don't know if there will be any appeal or anything like that, but that was just issued on Monday, okay? Moving on to ag, or unless we have any questions. All right. Okay, moving Look. on to ag nuisance. Um, you had mentioned uh, no pending lawsuits uh, today, but if you look at, I believe it is slide 22, and we'll get to that a little bit uh, here in a little bit, but from 1994 to 2019, we had 14 cases that went to trial, but as you get kind of closer to now, it seems like we're seeing less and less there. So do you see this as a trend, or, or why, why does this seem to be happening? Um, do I see it as a trend? I certainly hope so. <laughs> I certainly hope so for our industry. All I can do, what, what is it uh, uh, commodity traders always say, past performance cannot be used as a predictor of future whatever. Uh, I get to say that now. The history of these lawsuits cannot necessarily be, be used to predict uh, what will happen in the future, but it certainly looks like a good trend for our state and for uh, you folks producing livestock uh, that uh, we are seeing the, 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 the past has shown that uh, we've been successful in defending these cases and hopefully that is why we don't have uh, as many if any on file right now and hopefully that will continue but I emphasize over and over again we can't let our guard down keep uh, uh, and I know you don't need a lawyer sitting on a stool and poor Congress telling you uh, how to go out there and you know fight 10 degree below temperatures and still keep things going but keep those odor control practices in place keep working with neighbors etc coalition to support Iowa's farmers is a great resource etc quickly through the history slide uh, 18 um, uh, talks about what happened in North Carolina and uh, you know the settlements there and the very large jury verdicts um, fortunately unfortunately for North Carolina but fortunately for Iowa so far we haven't seen that here I've got some cases uh, on slide 19 let's stop at slide 20 for a second <clears throat> I talk about an Illinois case Scott County Illinois um, two 7,500 head capacity finishing barns a quarter mile apart, 10 plaintiffs, five residences, and went to trial in 2016. The jury returned a verdict of no nuisance. In 2020, then, uh, following the trial, the attorneys filed a motion for attorney's fees, because Illinois' right to farm law has, uh, has pretty good language uh, about uh, the, the plaintiff who brings a nuisance lawsuit can be, uh, if they do not prevail, can be liable for attorney's fees. The attorneys took, uh, filed a motion for that, went all the way to, to the Illinois Appeals Court, and then uh, Illinois Supreme Court did not take it up, so that was the final decision, and it was found that the right to farm law does apply, and that attorney's fees could be awarded to the uh, hog farmers attorneys <clears throat> had to go back to the trial judge to look at keep in mind this case went on for over 10 years from when it first started uh, and this is public record the judge has entered an order uh, uh, awarding attorneys fees for uh, just right at 2.5 million dollars okay that is uh, 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 that has been ruled on. Now that's under appeal. The amount is on appeal, uh, but the fact that attorneys' fees under Illinois' right to farm law could be awarded is not. So for those of you from Illinois, stay tuned to see how that case finally turns out. <coughs> um, the slide that Ben was talking about is uh, slide uh, 22. That's kind of my summary slide. And just, you know, uh, maybe uh, put a circle around that. That's where I, the first bullet point we talk about 1994 to 2019, total number of cases went to trial and what happened. Then we break it out in the next bullet point, 94 to 04, seven trials, six verdicts finding a nuisance. Not looking good. Then we go to 08 to 2019, seven trials, 
and four swine, three furtics, <coughs> pardon me, finding no nuisance, one that did, <coughs> pardon me, and three cattle cases and no verdicts finding a nuisance. So that's where I come up with this trend. Uh, the last three tri trials, uh, uh, one in 2016 and two in 2019, the juries presented evidence over what was in most cases a two to three week trial, evidence from those who claimed, those filing the lawsuit who said this is a nuisance. It, I can't do my daily activities, I'm not gonna get into details. And the juries were also presented with evidence from the uh, hog farm, from the farmers, cattle and hog, at, which said, uh, yeah, there's some odor, but it's nothing more than what you would experience in the, normal for the country. And witnesses who, the term I like to use, uh, because I am involved in some of these cases, the term I like to use is witnesses who don't have a dog in the fight. Now, those of you who are sports fans, uh, a few years ago, there was a National Football League quarterback who uh, was uh, convicted and sent to prison for uh, dog fighting. So there for a couple of years after that, I changed my, uh, my spiel in opening argument to the juries and said, they don't have a horse in the race. But it's been long ago, been long enough ago, I went back to the uh, no dog in the fight. Anyway, um, good trend for Iowa, but I repeat, don't let your guard down. Keep those odor control practices in place, and we hope that uh, that trend continues. I'm not going to get into any of the other slides on nuisance in the interest of time, which I think we're doing pretty well. Um, um, you know, well, let me back up a little bit just to say we have laws in Iowa, what we call the uh, right to farm laws. Uh, we have, uh, <laughs> we have uh, two that primarily, are, they're on slides uh, um, uh, 24 and 25. The one slide I often skip over, and I'm just gonna go to it even though I said I was moving on, I shouldn't skip over this slide. Steps to held, help avoid nuisance lawsuits and you know, there's location, there's tree buffers, there's building ventilation management. A lot of things there to keep your eye on. Again, can I point to any one of those that has uh, been the, the magic ticket to not being found a nuisance? The one that is probably, well, it is on their, uh, 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 you know, uh, neighborhood relations. I'm kind of, uh, as you can tell, stumbling a little bit here because the people that have been through lawsuits will tell you they've followed all these. They still got sued. Sometimes as a producer, and some of you have heard me say this before, you just plain have the wrong neighbors. And uh, that's unfortunate. You may, you may win in a lawsuit, but believe me, those producers that I've talked about who have won in court, uh, they, they uh, feel like they've been through the ringer. No fun to go through a lawsuit uh, at all. And I will say as an attorney, even though I make part of my living doing that, they're not fun. Uh, uh, they're not what I, I, there are a lot of things in my legal practice I would rather do than defend a producer in a nuisance lawsuit. If you can do everything you can to avoid it, please do. Take a look at that list. You may have a list of your own. Um, on over then on slide 24, um, <clears throat> I say protection for producer. I'm not selling it, but if you have concerns with neighbors, I've said this before, take a look at environmental policies. I'm sure there are uh, vendors upstairs that, are, uh, that have those policies available. Take a look at your liability policy. Talk to your insurance. Uh, provider, do you have coverage now? Most standard farm liability policies do not offer it. Uh, it's not covered for due to various uh, exemptions. If not, take a look at finding an environmental policy to get you that coverage that would protect you if you have that concern for your operation. And then we have the laws I talked about here in Iowa. Uh, getting over to slide 27, all right? I said there were no nuisance cases pending currently, and there is one up on appeal to the Iowa Supreme Court that was dismissed by the, the district court, 
the case was dismissed based on Iowa's uh, animal feeding operations nuisance defense. That's on appeal, so it's not currently scheduled for trial. Look at that last bullet point here again. Notice the date of uh, the court's decision. Um, further justification for my procrastination and getting my slides done. January 24th, Monday, district court issued a decision that in Iowa, the law is clear, and this court confirmed it, before a nuisance suit can be filed against an agricultural operation, it has to go through mediation first, at least be offered. In this case, it was a cattle manure application runoff case. The attorney for the plaintiff did not offer mediation first and, uh, and then file a lawsuit. The attorneys for the cattle operation filed a motion to dismiss and the court ruled, yes, you have to follow the law because it says a jurisdictional prerequisite. But the key point here is, for those of you who might get a little more involved in this, is that um, the, the fighting issue was there were claims in that lawsuit of trespass, the manure trespassed, the uh, um, um, negligence for allowing the manure, uh, the discharge to occur, et cetera, and the judge said, no, that all flows out of the nuisance part of it, so yes, mediation was required. And one of the issues here is uh, that there's a five-year statute of limitations on uh, property damage and this alleged property damage, and it will now have been more than five years since, because uh, they now have to refile the case, which they might, uh, after conducting mediation, and uh, the question will be, uh, is it too late? Have they missed the statute of limitations? That, all right. Let's move on to DNR regs to kind oh, of... Oh, we have a question. Ahead. Howard. Back to uh, slide 18, uh, the North Carolina situation. Well, they, they settled, and we were, obviously the industry was worried about a cascade of lawsuits, nuisance lawsuits. Yes. Correct. Once they settled those 21 cases, there's been no additional lawsuits. That's great. I'll go ahead and repeat it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, slide 18, North Carolina, big jury verdicts, settlements. The concern was always that that's going to come to Iowa, either in the form of the, the attorneys or just the concept. Uh, and based on the uh, our history, our and that was. Uh, um, uh, let's see, I'm looking at the slide with you. I get, I have too many dates to keep in my head. Uh, those settlements, uh, do I have a date? Yeah, 2020. So it's been, what, a uh, little over, well, be two years. So it hasn't been all that long. Uh, in my opinion, we were seeing the trend the other way even before these settlements. Uh, well, the first nuisance verdict, uh, in North Carolina that was pretty large was a couple years before that. So, yeah, I was getting questions from, uh, on behalf of Iowa Pork Producers Association and other attorneys here in Iowa who handle these cases. <clears throat> we were getting questions, oh my gosh, is this coming to Iowa? Well, you gotta be careful what you say at that point because it could have, uh, you know, I think we talked about, well, uh, production may be different here, et cetera, but, the hope was they wouldn't. The cases in 2019 that I talked about, 2016 and 2019, uh, really uh, jury verdicts uh, indicated it wasn't coming to Iowa and the fact that more haven't been filed since then reinforces that. Again, we don't know what will happen tomorrow, but right now we're not seeing that, it, that what happened in North Carolina come to Iowa. And as far as what I've seen, including Illinois that I talked about, where, and I also have a Minnesota case in your outline, we haven't seen that in the Midwest, fortunately for us. Okay? Yeah, I, I guess my question is why, why didn't it continue in North Carolina? Was it so, we oh. don't know what the oh, yeah. was, how it was, right? No, they, the, uh, the cases, you know, there were the large jury verdicts in, in North Carolina <clears throat> that were decided by juries in federal court. Those went up, those were appealed, and the appeals court upheld the verdicts on what we call compensatory damages, but kicked out the verdicts on the large punitive damages awards and said that has to go back for a, a proper determination in, under court procedure. At that point, I think it was the same day, the cases were settled. Not only those cases, settled out of court, confidential, 
We don't know what the settlement was, which is normal for an out-of-court settlement. Those cases were settled, plus, what do I say here, 21 were additional cases were waiting, and those were all settled. So uh, I haven't heard any more about anything in North Carolina, uh, any further cases, but those, those settlements uh, have, uh, again, we haven't seen that come to Iowa, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Are, <laughs> well, uh, okay, I, I, I can't get myself in trouble here, but yeah, I, I, or I will usually. Um, the, the question is, you have to assume those settlements were small enough that the attorneys aren't going to chase anymore, right? Are you suggesting that attorneys look at how big a oh, set? No. no, okay, I didn't <laughs> think you were. Uh, yeah, I think... Confidential settlements, but you have to, you know, confidential is confidential, but, you know, I, I have no idea what they were, but I assume some do. And obviously the attorneys who were representing the neighbors suing knew what they were. We haven't seen, they couldn't do anything in those cases because they were, had settled them. We haven't seen any more cases. So uh, have I sufficiently danced around that? I thought so. I thought so. All right. We have a, Eldon, we have a question in the back. Um, the operations that were at issue in that in the North Carolina case, I'm just wondering, do you know how much operational control Smithfield retained on those contracts? Like, what did what are the the contracts look like? Like, did Smithfield operate those? Did they have the employees in that? Was it a triple net? I see, I see. Um, I don't know for sure. Maybe there's somebody here who does. As my understanding, they were a contract grower arrangement where Smithfield provided the obviously the pigs. They were owned the pigs, and the contract grower was in charge of management, uh, in charge of uh, taking care of the pigs, and was paid a, a contract fee for that. In other words, as my understanding, it wasn't Smithfield employees who were uh, taking care of the pigs. It was the contract growers. Okay, that's my understanding and nobody's uh, raising their hand to indicate otherwise. So, okay, answer your question? All right. Real quick, let's move on to DNR rules, uh, looking at open burning, we're on slide 28. Um, All right. Can you kind of talk about what producers should know uh, on some of those uh, issues and, and code around that? Well, if you're looking at your table of contents, which you, uh, I'm sure you are, um, uh, this is under, um, uh, Iowa DNR, and you would think, how do we go from ag nuisance to open burning? What the heck's going on here? I have two slides here that I wanted to cover with you, uh, open burning and solid waste. We're talking about DNR uh, regulation here. Why did I put those in? Because we've had a couple of storms here in Iowa that uh, uh, were real doozies, right? The derecho of a year ago, and then we had the storm here in December, which some have called the winter derecho. Got a few questions after that when, unfortunately, buildings got destroyed, partially, totally, et cetera. And what are the DNR rules about uh, uh, getting rid of those buildings? Uh, burn, bury, haul to a landfill, uh, whatever. I, these are the DNR rules, slides 28 and 29. Let's start with burning. This is the one, that last bullet point I want you to focus on. Uh, <clears throat> wait, excuse me, not the last bullet point, but I better look at uh, the second to the last bullet point. Disaster rubbish must comply with asbestos removal requirements under NESHAP, a federal law that covers asbestos removal. Here's the point. Building gets uh, blown down, you want to, what, what's the normal procedure that I hear about is dig a hole, push it in, burn what will burn, cover it up, right? I know producers who have been cited for a violation by DNR for not having an asbestos removal uh, certification done before that building went into that hole and you burn it, okay? Now you may say, how many buildings do you know of that have asbestos in them? And I would probably say not very many, of, at least now. Um, all I'm telling you is, uh, if you have that situation, some, uh, there's some still uh, building rubble out there following the last storm. 
um, to ensure yourself of not having a DNR violation, and I've represented our producers in a couple of them, uh, contact an asbestos removal person, I'll call it, and what I understand from DNR is what you need is just a letter of some kind that says the person either has looked at photos of the site or has been on site and looked at the rubble and, and will say there is no asbestos in there, okay? Uh, what about burial? What about digging that hole? Uh, we'll just, in, in the interest of time, just, uh, th these are the rules. Uh, you gotta find a well-drained site, et cetera. But according to DNR rules, the pit that you buried in, and you can bury those buildings on site, okay, on the premises where they were destroyed, and first of all, you gotta get all the manure out of it, okay? And then the burial pit, by rule, cannot be deeper than six foot and needs 24 inches of final cover, okay? Just uh, uh, part of, this part of the talk is uh, where I try and let you know some of the things that uh, if you're working with an operation on a daily basis, consultants, uh, producers, et cetera, these are the, some of the rules that I see producers sometimes get hung up on. Ben, can we go to the next one? I go from burying buildings and burning them to uh, human sanitary waste. All right. Now we have a series of slides. That, these are my slides where I, uh, I say we have a rule. And we'll talk about several here, but this one. When rules go into effect, uh, most of them anyway, if not all, they're only effective or requirements from that date forward. Well, if you have a building built before that date, are you subject to a rule that goes into effect uh, that says otherwise? No. And here's what I'll say, and I'm gonna cover several of these. Uh, we got about eight minutes, Two right? minutes, yeah. Um, you know, sometimes I say to producers, I don't know how you keep track of all this. It's my job to keep track of it, and I have to go look it up. I have to look up the dates, et cetera. Same thing can be said for DNR folks. Good people, but there, there have been a lot of changes in the rules over the years, and sometimes we get mixed up and look at a building today when they're out there on a site visit, and the rule says today you have to have, uh, you can't have human sanitary waste, either from the laboratory, the shower, or the toilet going into that manure pit. And don't give me a hard time on why the DNR rule says that. It does. <laughs> Uh, anyway, you have to have a septic system. DNR comes out today, looks at your site, says, where's the septic system? You say, well, gosh, I don't, we didn't put one in. You need one. And, but was your building built before May 12th, 1999? I realize we're getting a few years away from that, but if it was, you didn't have to have it until that date. Make sure you know the dates that you're, uh, and be sure you, uh, you or whoever you're working with, uh, if DNR suggests there's a violation there, have somebody look into the dates to see, make sure that you aren't okay because you were valid when built. Speaking of that, slide 31. Now, uh, slides 31 and 32. Perimeter tile. We have, let's go to 30, well, 31 just says what you have to have today. This is the current rule. Small print, I give you the rule if you need to go look it up, but basically the rule today says if you have a deep pit building, uh, it has, and you can either determine the level of the groundwater table or put in a groundwater, a per, toe drain, perimeter tile. And the rule today says that perimeter tile either has to outlet on site, on your premises, or you need a shut off and a monitoring port. That's the rule. That hasn't always been the rule for deep pit buildings. Go to slide 32. Had a couple of cases of this just recently. This is, if, if you have a deep pit building without a perimeter tile, okay, what date was that built? I go through the dates here on that slide. If you have a deep pit building that does not have a permit, okay, uh, you weren't required, and that's on uh, slide 32, uh, you weren't required to have 
a tow drain at all until March 24th of 2004, if it didn't have a permit. If it had a permit, you were required to have it as of 96. Then the question is, okay, after that date, did, could you have hooked that perimeter tile into a field tile? Yes. But that, uh, without any sort of shutoff or monitoring port. But that changed in September 15th of 2010 and, uh, and also removed the exemption for SAFOs, small animal feeding operations. Okay, here's my point. Slide, uh, slide 32, if you've got this situation or if you have a, uh, maybe keep that in mind if nothing else, if you have a building that fits into this and if it's suggested to you by DNR or otherwise that you need an outlet, a tile outlet, or a monitoring port or shut off, if you don't have that outlet, make sure you know when your building was built and what were the rules when your building was built. Because we found situations where it is not required because they were built before this requirement went into place, okay? All right, I know this is a little detailed, but believe me, if you have this situation, this slide 32, I go look it up every time. It is one of the most confusing parts of the rules because there was a rule amendment. Then there was another rule amendment that put it in a different spot. It's very hard to track. I sympathize with DNR in keeping track of this. But this is important to you if you're in that situation and they come out and say, well, you have to put in a monitoring port or the tile itself and, and you were legal when you were built. That should be brought to their attention. All right, slide 33. Uh, water source separation distances. What the heck is a water source? All right, this is where I'm going to reveal to you where I'm from. It's a crick, all right? Not a creek, it's a crick. All right. You can laugh, all right? Where I'm from, it's a crick. All right, not from Des Moines, but where I'm originally from. All right. Uh, the various dates on when the separation distance for a, again, a deep pitted building went into effect from a crick. And I lay it out on the slide there, and we've had instances where DNR had uh, issued a notice of violation to a producer for not meeting the distance to the crick, but the producer had built when that distance was not in effect. It only applied to the major water sources, the rivers, etc. So again, take a look at what was, it, what was the rule when you were constructed before you uh, uh, write the check to DNR, I guess is the way to say it. Okay. Eldon, I think we're about uh, time here. Is there any more questions any folks have or anything like that? Oh, I didn't even get to the good ones. Well, Eldon will be <laughs> here a little bit after the session if you have any other further questions. Uh, again, please fill out the seminar evaluation as well as the seminar schedule. Uh, get your stamp there. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming today. And yeah, Eldon, I think we should start at like 3.15 next time and call it Beers with Ben and Eldon. So. All right. Have a good day, folks. Thanks. Enjoy Pork Congress.